All right, so we're talking about probability. If there are 36 things that can happen when you roll two dice, and you know now that the probability of a 7, for instance, is 6 out of 36, if you were going to play a dice game with your little brother, and you wanted to uh, torture him, and he doesn't understand probabilities, you could say, okay, let's play this game where we were going to roll the two dice, and any time the dice comes up with a, a 5 or a 12, you win. And any time the dice comes up with a 7 or an 8, I win. You see how that would be totally abusing him with probability? Because you're going to have how many possible things? You're going to ha ha win if you get a 7 or a, what did I say, a 6? An 8. Okay. So you're going to win with these two which there are 5 plus 6 is 11 ways you can get those things. And you told him he's going to win if he gets a 12 or a what? All right, so that's five ways that he could win. So you have 11 ways to win, he has five ways to win. See what I'm saying? Even though there's both, they're just two numbers, you each get two numbers, uh, you could even let them pick randomly and just hope that they don't pick like 7 and 8. Uh, so, I want you to just take a second and figure out a game that you think that the general public would not, since they tend to not understand how 12 is so unlikely to come up, okay? Figure out a game in just a couple minutes that you could make where you win if this comes up and they win if that comes up. And I want it to be so that you have a advantage over them, but only a small advantage. Okay, because that's what a casino does. They make games that aren't totally obvious that they're going to win. Like, they, they don't make games where it's two to one in their favor. A typical casino game is like 2% benefit to them. Okay, so figure out a game that actually seems like they should win, but in effect, you're going to win over the long haul. Okay, I'll pause for a second, and you figure out which numbers should you give them to win, which number should you give you to win so that you've got a slight edge, but it seems like they have an edge if they don't understand probability. Okay, so who's got an idea of the, like, you win if, okay, yes, sir. Okay, hold on. They win. <laughs> you weren't the only one, huh? 2, 3, 11, and 12. And? And you get, like, make you the red one. Six and eight. All right. So then you have you have actually a huge edge, though, don't you? Six. You got. S they have six outs, so to speak, and you have ten outs. So you have a, you have like fifty percent higher chance of winning than they do. They have four numbers, and you have two. That's true. All right. Well, you definitely set it up so that you would win by a relatively small margin. The how small the margin is the only thing I'm arguing. Another idea for a game that you think people would, that don't understand probability, would think, oh, this is cool. I have a good chance to win. Yes, sir. Okay, hold on. So that's you. You're the casino. Casino wins on six, seven, eight, and nine. And they win on everything else. Interesting. Have you figured it out? What are they... There's obviously 36 total, so let's see how many you win out of. You win out of 11, uh, 16, 20 out of the 36, and they would win on 16 out of the 36. So the casino, I could see people playing a game where all I have to avoid is 6, 7, 8, and 9. I win every time anything other than 6, 7, 8, or 9 comes up. Okay? Any other all right, then let's try it. I'll be the casino, and we'll actually, that was theoretical probability, right? What am I about to do then? Uh, experimental. experimental. All right, so let's just see if, what happens in the real world. Do casinos some days lose money? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So let's see. Let's say that it was a buck each throw, okay? 
and I'm, I'm the casino, I'm going to win every time it's six, seven, eight, or nine, right? All right. And it's a nine. Woohoo! I win. Okay, so this is casino. One for the casino, one for the stooge. Actually, there's none for the stooge yet. All right. And it's a seven. I win again. See, the problem with this part is the stooge probably walks away as like, this game's stupid. But maybe he's going to say, ooh, I'm feeling lucky now because it's got to be a win for me because he's won twice in a row. Seven. Cena wins again. Now I'm going to double my bet because I really think I'm due for a win. That's what goes through people's minds. They start thinking, okay, if I lost before, then I'm more likely to win now. Do you get how that's not true? It's just as likely to win or lose now, but, but they're going to think that since I lost a whole bunch, all right, so then they're going to double their bet. So this is going to count for two wins or two losses. It's an eight. Oh, can't believe it. How is that even possible? Now I'm going to triple my bet. I'm going to put down three bucks on this one. It's a nine. Oh, so close. Sorry. I tripled my bet. I've lost every dollar I brought now. <laughs> yes, most casinos win on average $52 from the people that come into them. So I'm sure that he probably would have more than eight bucks. But I don't want to keep going forever. Yes. If he won something. If, if this is just how many wins he had, and if he had bet a dollar each. I guess I'm not getting your question. So let's say you put a dollar out on the table, so to speak, because they don't want to just trust you that you'll pay them, right? So you either put a chip or a dollar or something on the table, okay? And then you play the game and you lose. Okay, okay. If we do wins or dollars, in this case, my every win was a dollar. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Okay. But it, the, that he would have gotten not only his own dollar back, but he would have, it was a win. For, so from the casino's perspective, when they get the dollar, it's a pure win, right? When, from his perspective, if he gets the dollar back, of course, that's just his money in the first place. But he would also get a dollar from the casino. So you'd have to, so if we had had a stooge win, it wouldn't have just been getting his own dollar back. It would have been his own dollar back plus a dollar. Okay. So that's how you got to think of that. All right. Anyway. So, how about this? Evens odds. Which do you want? We're going to play the game? You want odds? I'll take evens then. All right. Okay. Isn't that fair? Isn't it like 50 50? You want odds? Ah, okay. So now you are sitting looking at the math saying, how, how can you decide that? Well, you look at your chart. If I add up all the evens, oh, probability of four is not on my chart here. It must be on, is it on your chart? Okay, good. All right, it should be 18 and 18, yes. Um, now, how about this? Counter this argument. But the, t the list of numbers starts with 2, and it ends with 12. So isn't there more even numbers? Okay. So the probability of four does need to be on my list here somewhere. I really wish I could get it in there right now. Maybe I can. If I hit enter here, maybe I can put in probability of four. Four. By the way, what would it be? Three out of 36? Thank you. Four. Break that up. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, then I should really move this to keep symmetry going. I'll leave 
the gap. I can live with the gap. Okay. So anyway, now if I add them all up, this should be 36. And that's a really important, oops, we'll fix that. All right. So uh, even odds we figured out is exactly fair. How about this? What if you set up a game where you have different values for how much you win? Like on two and three, you just lose. And on four and five, you get double your money. So on these, it's lose. This is double. And on all the other ones, you just get a single return back. Like as in, you get a, if you if you bet a buck, you get a, your own buck pl plus a buck. Okay, now double's not probably the right word. Hmm. Yeah, it's more like triple. I'm gonna say it this way: if you if you get these two, we'll just say you double your money. Let's go with triple your money on these two, uh, and the rest of them. Uh, let's just keep it lose, lose, lose. Because you're gonna win if you hit seven. In fact, you triple your money if you get a seven. Does that seem like it's probably a pretty good deal because you triple your money every time you get a seven and a seven is likely to happen? Would you play this game or not? Yeah. All right. So you're going to only lose. No, it's, it's, it's a good. It, it, they're right. You're, it was not a trick question. It was, it is as obvious as you'd think because of that seven being tripled. What if I change that seven to being lose? All right, so if you were to, this, your theory is theoretically you think it would lose, and how about if you tried it with a experiment, experimental probability? Is it possible you're wrong? But do you just simply add up the lo losing ones and go, okay, this, 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 this. Do you say that adds up to 21? Right, nine. That's 24. Wouldn't you have to factor in that you're going to get more than just a win if you hit this one? You get what I'm saying? That's better than just a win. So these are all wins, which is 9, 10, 11, 12. There's 12 winners, so to speak. But this triple your money deal is worth more than just five. But I don't think it's worth enough to balance it out. I think you would still lose in this game. All right. Okay, I just wanted to help you think through what casinos and insurance companies and uh, lotteries are all about. They're trying to figure out making something that's attractive to you. Insurance companies don't want to charge you a ton. Of nobody would buy their insurance. They have to buy, charge enough so that they make money, and make the odds in their favor, but they can't charge too much or nobody will buy their stuff. If you know, uh, casinos don't want to try to make too much or their, their casino will everybody be like, that's a terrible casino. They try to take too much of your money. You lose when you go there. Nobody come to this casino anymore. So they have to set it just right so that they've got enough of an edge on you with probability, but not too much so that you realize it. Yes? If you didn't have insurance then, would it be better than not having insurance? That's a very good point. Insurance companies are designed to make profit on you. So, so if you can go without insurance on something, you, you will make money on average. But you're taking a risk too, right? So even if, I know people that are very wealthy and they could go without insurance because it's pretty likely that if they never are going to have the accident such that, and in fact, in the state of Minnesota, you don't even have to have car insurance if you put a bond aside this so that the government knows you have like I think the, the amount is a million bucks in the bank then you can go without insurance you can choose to not have car insurance because they know that if you have an accident they can take that bond and use it to pay out the claim for the person that you hurt okay normally insurance would do that for you but you can opt out of insurance because of that exact thing they don't want to force people to have to buy insurance which allows the insurance company to make money. So you're basically forcing this person to give other people money. So 
it is true, you can opt out of insurance, but most rich people still don't because they're afraid that if they have the accident and somebody sues them and knows, oh, they're rich. Wouldn't you like to be the person who got hit by the really rich person? <laughs> be like, cool, I can get him to pay me like a million dollars because he's got so much money. So you'd rather have the insurance company between you and them so that the insurance company c takes the hit if there's an accident. Yes? Yep. It's a very good question. So if we change this to a three dice rolling instead of a two dice rolling, then do you think seven would be the most common number anymore? No, we could still do the same kind of a chart though, couldn't we? But now it would go from what's the smallest number you could get? Three. three to what's the biggest number you could get? Six times three is 18. And it'd be just like this. You'd have a list from three to 18 and we make all the possibilities, all the things that you'd need to get. So what would be the least likely number to get? A three. And there would be three out of, and now use what you already learned. We have 36 combos with two dice. How many would there be with three dice? Six times six times six. Okay, so there'd be that many possible combinations. And the chart would be nasty because whatever 36 times six is, is a lot. And so there'd be, it'd be hard to figure out, but you could figure it out just the same way you'd figure this out. Okay, good questions. We need to move on. Um, in these kinds of games, let's see if you can figure out what they all have in common. That's probability, they're all probability and that's true. Got darts. There's some skill, yes. Those are about impossible, yes, because if you hit the edge, it bounce, uh, bounces out. So it seems like the, the total area that you could land in and win is uh, like like fairly big area you could land in, but it's really very hard to actually land in that area. What do you think? There's definitely skill involved. Yeah, and it's the probabilities, you have to factor out that skill. Because if you're really good at hitting that spot, uh, then you're going to be, your probabilities are totally different than somebody else's probabilities. Then you have to do experimentals and say, I had the kid, ch you know, try 10 throws and he got 8 out of 10 and the other kid only got 2 out of 10. Then you go with those probabilities instead of theoretical. Because theoretical probabilities assume random chance. This one's dropping the clothespin in the bottle. I don't know if you've ever tried it. It's kind of fun. Something that's an old game from way back in the day because there was no internet. <laughs> Putting the tail on the donkey. And they all have to do with, what do you think? Areas. They all have to do with areas. So, yes, one of them has to do with pi. Um, so, okay, anyway, uh, pi r squared is what you'd, you'd use to do this. So if I was doing pi r squared, you could do r squared in your head. And it's important to note that 3 squared is 9. 9 times pi is an answer. And it's, in fact, the most accurate answer. You know why that's better than 9 times 3.14? Because 3.14 isn't really pi. It's just close. Okay, so well, let's remind you where that is on your calculator. So grab your calculator, type in 9, and then do you know where the pi button is? Because that's the most accurate way to do it. So find the pi button, which is right above the caret, which is way over on the right-hand side. And type in 9 times the pi button and hit enter. 28.26 what? 27. Don't tell me the whole thing. 28.2. Good enough. Okay. Now let's try 9 times 3.14 and just see what the difference is. 9 times 3.14 instead. 28 point what? 26 even? All right. So now, can you tell that there's a difference there? Now, when you're talking about small numbers, it's not that big of a deal. In this case, it, either one would round to 28.3, either way. But what if these are in billions of dollars? Our government deals in that kind of thing. Our government's debt right now is in trillions with a T. So if you take and add a few zeros to this, all of a sudden, you'll see it makes a big difference. So I'm going to put in a comma here, and let's say that this was, that would, whoop, one too many, that would be in millions, and all of a sudden, 
if I put a comma in here, if that was in millions of dollars, how many dollars different is it? It's $14,000 difference. See what I mean? So what if you're not dealing in millions, which is like what companies a lot of times deal with, what if you're dealing in billions, which is like what state level governments deal in? All of a sudden, you're off by $15 million. Okay, and what if you're dealing in something the government deals in, the federal government, which is trillions of dollars, then all of a sudden the difference is $15 billion. So, anyway, the point is that a rounding like that really doesn't make much difference if you're talking about very small numbers. You're talking about big numbers, it can make a big difference. So, just wanted to make sure you knew where the pi button was. What should you use in your homework? Most times it won't matter because our numbers are small enough that it really won't matter much. But if I was choosing, it's, is it faster to type the pi button or a 3.14? The pi button, actually, because you need to get second and then pi, right? That's two keystrokes versus 3.14, which is three keystrokes. Okay, so. Three, oh, 3.14 is four keystrokes. So, two versus four. So it's half as, it's just twice as fast. Yes. Oh, if you're doing pi, you don't have to do the times button? Ooh. That saves you another keystroke. Very good. Yes. All right. Good question. Say that we're talking about uh, an area of something that we are going to have to paint. Okay. So if the government is going to paint a giant circle in the center of the country so that it can be seen from satellites. And now the cost of the paint is going to be, of course, related to how much big the circle is. And so if some guy just used 3.14 because he knew that was what pi was, but he's wrong, all of a sudden now our numbers are off. And I hear you. I, I, I get you. There's, no, there's not many chances that the government's going to spend like a trillion dollars on a circle. But then again, I wouldn't put it past the government to uh, come up with that. And somebody somewhere has got to be coming up with all these crop circles, which of course are, s yeah, they could be. Um, but those, those crop circles are actually probably made by human beings who are, apparently you can make it with a rope. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. It's, you've done it before. Yeah, yeah. If you guys were from a farming community, I'm sure some of you probably would have done it before, but... Uh, all right, so your homework for today typically involves problems that will come down to this. Area of what you want over area of what's possible. That's almost always what we do in probability. What you want over what's possible. Even the hard problems are going to come down to that. Here's a harder problem. What do we want? We want the blind goat to eat the dandelions. <laughs> All right. So now, the reason we made him blind is because, not because we wanted to abuse the goat, but because we wanted to add the randomness piece in here. Because if he knows the dandelions are over there, he's going to walk over there and eat them. So what's the probability that the blind goat is going to eat the dandelions? So, well, first of all, you've got to know what you want. What I want is that little 15-foot patch. But what's possible is much more complicated in this case. Yes, sir? Oh, Stop. Maybe he doesn't know what dandelions smell like because he's from Martian. He's a Martian goat. That'll work. Because I know there's no, there's, well, of course, there might be Martian dandelions if there's Martian goats too, so I don't know. All right, moving on. What's possible is the whole circle, right? Well, I can see the radius of the circle. See? It's like, that's fairly easy. So shouldn't I just put pi r squared down there? No, because the whole circle would be wrong. I got to take the whole circle, which is pi r squared, and what's r in this case? 10. So 10 squared is 100. So it's 100 pi, but then I got to take away something. The barn. How do I figure out the area of the barn? Don't think of it as the area of the barn. Think of it as part of the circle. How much of the circle can he not get to? Why is it one fourth? Because it's a 90 degree angle, very good. If this is 90 degrees, then the total degrees in a circle is 
so therefore one fourth of the circle is off limits. So you could just say, instead of all of the circle, what's really possible? Three fourths, three fourths of that. So instead of 100 pi, we'd say three fourths of 100 pi. Or you could have figured out what 100 pi is and then subtract off one fourth of that. That would have been okay too. And yes, three fourths of 100 is 75. So final answer is 15 over 75 pi. Now, can you just multiply that out and get a decimal? Yes, and that's what you should do in your homework is get decimals. The answers will be on the homework key as decimals. So just take your answers whenever they're fractions, divide them, get a decimal, and we're generally going to round to three places. So it'll be like 0.178 or whatever. Okay? All right. I think you find the homework for today is fairly straightforward. We have...